Welcome to STEMiverse Podcast Episode 46. In this episode, Peter and Marcus talk with Jesse King. Jesse is a Wani descendant who has a passion for education and the opportunities it provides for everyone involved. He has close ties to the Mount Isa and central Queensland regions through his father and mother's family. Jesse attended school in Townsville and completed his teacher training at Charles Darwin University. Jesse is keenly interested in the opportunities 21st century pedagogy offers for learners of all abilities and backgrounds. Jesse has experience in classroom teaching, school leadership, learning management system implementation, school strategic planning, and has successfully gained funding and delivered a variety of programs at the school level. This is Stemiverse Podcast Episode 46. Stemiverse is a podcast produced by Tech Explorations. Our mission is to help educators become awesome at teaching STEM, be it at home or in the classroom. Whether you are a professional or casual teacher teaching in a classroom or a parent or caretaker teaching at home, this podcast brings you the knowledge and experiences of practitioners, academics, entrepreneurs and lifelong learners who are passionate about education and strive every day to help our children prepare for life in a world of radical change and why not abundance. This podcast is brought to you by Tech Explorations, a leading provider of educational resources for makers, STEM students and teachers. For a limited time only, go to texplore.com slash stemiverse and receive Peter's latest ebook, Maker Education Revolution, a book about how making is changing the way that people learn and teach in the 21st century. Hey, Marcus. Hey, Peter. How's your week been so far? <laughs> it's been a fun week this week with lots on. What about yourself? Oh. Yeah, it's been a very hectic week. I'm saying so far because it's not over yet. We are halfway through Friday. Mm -hmm. There's still a lot to do. Yes, yes. But right now, we've got Jesse King with us. A great guest. Yes. Uh, tell me more about Jesse. So, uh, so Jesse is uh, well, Townsville, northern Queensland. So how north is that, Peter? It's quite north, quite north. <laughs> So we're in Sydney, so that, that would be like, what, 2,000 kilometers from here? Yeah. North? Is, that, is that about right, Yeah, Jesse? it sounds about right. It's, uh, I think it's about 1,100 to Brisbane as the crow flies, but, yeah, I'm in shorts and a shirt, so that's how far north I am. Yeah. <laughs> it's wearing hoodies at this point in time. Yes, we are dressing up now. Um, what's the climate like at your end of the woods? Yeah, Townsville sits in the dry tropics. It's quite a big place. I think that oh, well, I think it's fairly big. There's a, over 160, 170 thousand people. Um, you know, it's pretty well serviced, but you've got a lot of great spots around. You've got the Maggie Island or Magnetic Island across the the bay, and you're not far to go up into the wet tropics and around the Cairns region, and you're sort of a similar distance to get down to the Whit Sundays. So there's mm. always plenty to do and plenty of sunshine. So what does the population of Townsville look like? Is it mostly mining people or, you know, what's mm. the background of the industry perhaps? Yeah, Townsville does have a, a, a fairly heavy industry focus. Um, there's also a, a really large army base. I'm not sure if it's the biggest in Australia, but it'd be close. Um, so, and there's a RAF base as well. So, and there's also a lot of, there's a couple of refineries that sort of service the the um, minerals that have been mined out, out west, out towards Mount Isa and whatnot. So it's fairly diverse and economy uh, probably lacks a little bit of tourism. But, yeah. um, that you know, Cairns, you've got it's wedged in between uh, Cairns and uh, the Whit Sundays, you've, you've got a lot of competition. So, <laughs> yes. but, um, it, you know, in the university, James Cook University is quite a big... Uh, a big uh, employer in the in the region as well with the the health services, Townsville Health Services, the quite a large hospital, very, very well resourced hospital that sort of reaches out into these areas out across the the northern Australia. So yeah, it's a lot happening, but uh, you know not too much traffic, which is nice. Mm. <laughs> Does, so you guys are closer to I'd say Asia than uh, mm. we are to you. 
does mm. is, there, is there an Asian influence in Townsville, or has it changed the way that you guys operate? Uh, look, I've sort of only been back in Townsville for a couple of years, so I think uh, our closest capital city, I've been told, I haven't actually double-checked this, but our, apparently our closest capital city is Port Moresby, not Brisbane. Oh, so right. <laughs> there's definitely... <laughs> um, pretty much it's Australia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so... You know, I think definitely with um, the resource sectors, that there definitely would be um, influence into those those markets, um, and also the cattle industry. You know, there's there's cattle industry up here as well. So, um, but I couldn't. I'm not an industry specialist. So I no, probably no, couldn't no. go too much further into it. No, it's all, hey, it's all good. Jesse, um, how about you take uh, a minute or two and tell us about yourself, your background as an educator. Uh, you can go as far back as you like. Should I say 40,000 years, or maybe that's too much? <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe it's not enough. <laughs> yeah, no, the, um, yeah, yeah, so, well, I grew up in Townsville. My mother is a teacher, so I sort of found myself at that time in my life where I had to decide what to do and ended up in an education degree. Um, and then I ended up in the, in the Northern Territory and finished that off up there. So... Being an Aboriginal person from my father's side come is up tied up around uh, Mount Isa is where he grew up in mm-hmm. Camerwell, which is a small little cattle town out on the border of Northern Territory in Queensland. The um, I had a lot of family out west and family up in the Northern Territory and wanted to get to know them and uh, went up for a couple of weeks and stayed for nearly ten years. <laughs> so, <laughs> I yeah, know what that is like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, it's, um, I finished my, I, I did a little bit of work around and about and, and then I got back into my, my teacher training and completed that at a, a school in, in Catherine in the Northern Territory, mm-hmm. in, which is about three hours south of Darwin, but it, it's got about ten to 15,000 people. It's not as small as um, some people might <laughs> imagine yeah. places out there get and there are small places out there, but fairly well serviced and good um good access to fishing spots and whatnot so but um yeah and then taught up there until 2015 when I began working with CSIRO in the current capacity and mm-hmm. current role I'm in so sort of the son of a uh, the, the son the, the child of a chalky mm-hmm. and that's mm-hmm. sort of the the path that I've I've gone down as well. So what's mm. a chalky? Sorry, I don't understand the term. <laughs> like uh, a chippy and a sparky in a way. <laughs> Come on, this is your Australian <laughs> it's new word for Yeah, it's probably, it's probably a bit dated, the term chalky. <laughs> now I don't think there are too many chalkboards hanging around. Oh, in, I see. Got it, got it, got it. Dry erasing. Right. Mm. So your father was a teacher? Uh, my no. mother was a teacher. Mother, Dad's yeah. a... Dad's a public servant, or he was a public servant. He's mm. retired now, so he's off. He's a gypsy travelling around Australia <laughs> at the moment. Retired. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's um, enjoying himself, but um, yeah. So, could you tell us about like the early, I suppose, um, the early inklings of thoughts of you becoming a teacher? Obviously, it, it does run in the family, it seems, but. Kids do have the freedom to choose whatever they want. You chose to become an educator. Can you tell us why you did that? Yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> the um, look, I uh, I have a, quite a large family from um, my dad's side and, and on my mum's side as well. And my sort of childhood growing up was, you know, we, I, I grew up in staff rooms, <laughs> mm. sitting around waiting for mum to finish work and and whatnot. So. Sort of school's always been a part of my life, and it also, you know, I really enjoyed coaching at the time. I was doing a bit of coaching with uh, sports. I was playing uh, with younger younger kids, and I enjoyed that. And I think I've probably got that natural personality to be able to chat and converse with people. So the sort of um, I nearly was going to become an occupational therapist was one of my right, first right. selections. But um, right at the end, before they closed the preferences, I swapped over to, to education and I sort of, you know, my, my mum was probably a big, you know, growing up thinking about how my mum, her career and, you know, I thought, 
maybe I could see myself in the in the same sort of space. Uh, so that your mother had a positive influence, uh, not oh. just you know, as a mother, but also as a professional, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think um, I think that's something both my parents and instilled into me the the work ethic and you know the the fact that they they're both very hard workers, um, but definitely. Uh, I'm not going to lie. The, at the <laughs> as as a 17 year old, the school holidays were uh, <laughs> were definitely something that was crossing my mind. But um, as I get older now, it's <laughs> and I, I reflect back on it. I'm sort of I think it's a it's a great job to be in to to work with uh, people who want to help you know help grow mm. minds and and I think the when I when I stopped my training. And I had a, had a, I think I had two years off where I just sort of went and did a whole bunch of different little odd jobs here and there. Um, I really found that when I got back into a school, there was never one day was the same. Hmm. There mm-hmm. was always something new and exciting and something that I, I never... I, 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 in other jobs, I'd be like, oh, wake up, I don't know, I want to go to work today, but I've never felt that in a, in the education space. I'm always excited to get up and get into the day and get into the the teaching and learning and, yeah. and, yeah, and you know, lots of, lots of good fun and lots of good progress to be had. It is, uh, I suppose, a, sp- a special, it's not just a job, right? Um, no. It's more than a job. What was your first um, assignment like? Can you remember, like, graduating from university, being a teacher now, you've got your first class. What was that like? <laughs> I actually was uh, lucky in the program I went through. I was working at the school I began teach my teaching career at as an Indigenous education worker. So that had a, a very specific su- support for Indigenous students in the school and working with families and communities and working with teachers to make sure they're, you know, being culturally appropriate and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, so I sort of transitioned from that role into, into a teaching teaching role. So I, I was lucky in the sense that I didn't and I wasn't going into an unknown place, I guess. I was mm-hmm. I already knew that had re- established relationships with students, with staff, with, with the kids, you know, with the families. So uh, I was probably quite lucky in in that sense for a lot of new teachers uh, not only do they go to a, a new school and a new career path but often they change cities and move a long way away from home mm. and whatnot so yeah but uh it was definitely you know your first year always seems like it just hits you like a freight train <laughs> it doesn't matter it doesn't matter how how much you've been in schools or how much you've done at uni it just does never seems like um you know, it's just it's another. Hard work, um, right? it, it is extremely hard work. It's um, and it it's but it but it's extremely rewarding too. So that's that gets you there. But there's nothing nothing better than the, you know, getting to the end of the year and <laughs> having the having the kids. You know, I think you can see the the kids grow over that that period of time you're with them. What did you teach? What did I teach mm. in my first year? I taught uh, maths. Hmm. Taught uh, year eight and year ten maths. I taught PE. I, I, I couldn't. I can't even actually remember. I think that they were my, my PE maths was probably what I was doing. It wasn't that long ago, but um, yeah. So PE maths, uh, a bit yeah, of IT. The specialty yeah. was mathematics and PE. Yeah. I, I was actually a primary trained. I'm a primary trained teacher, so my specialty is everything. Yeah. <laughs> the um, but. The as as you get in small places, you know sometimes you teach out of field, but a little bit. But I, I definitely have a, a maths brain, and the, I think you know the kids in, enjoyed and progressed yeah. in, in my classes. But it's 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 a hard gig when you're out in these smaller locations, and you've sort of got to you know what you've got to teach your suite of subjects, and you've got a set of skill sets from your teachers, and you've got to work out what's going to be best. For your students, mm-hmm. so yeah. yeah. So, did you? I was going to say, do you have? Did you have more or less resources than a? I guess a a, a cosmo. Know, cosmopolitan is the wrong word. A metropolitan. Perhaps, a metropolitan. A metropolitan. Metropolitan. Thank you, <laughs> metro teacher. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, I think the one of the 
look, we're a fairly well-resourced school in the sense of, um, you know, we had lots of... You, know, you were lucky it was a uh, prep to year 10 at the time, so we had a science lab, we had a home ec room, manual arts lab, so... But, you know, you also had a wide range of other facilities there. The, the biggest part would be connectivity. So mm-hmm. I think we had a two megabit connection for uh, 400 students, 60, 70 mm-hmm. staff members, you know. Uh, and it was the way it was set up at the time. A lot of the stuff had to, like, uh, authenticate back in the servers in Darwin. Mm-hmm. So you'd you'd be sending the the two meg line and be you know for your login servers would be sending it back up and down the road to Darwin, three hundred kilometres away to check back in. So mm. and then that was a big issue. So yeah, you, you couldn't uh, you know it took a lot of you have to be really across how you're going to bring these digital experiences into the classroom because. You couldn't just rely on mm-hmm. flicking a web page open and yeah. going to it. You had yeah. to, YouTube, not you had to get a bit creative with it all. But um, when I left, we got we got we got twenty we got an upgrade to twenty megs up and down, which was amazing. Um, but then as, as I was driving out the gate, the uh, the MBN team were rolling out the fibre. <laughs> so, oh, so yeah, so I actually video conferenced into the school yesterday and had a chat with the science teacher in Catherine yesterday. So. Mm-hmm. The connectivity now is, is, you know, even in three, four years, is is really improved up there. Yeah. So, so they're connected to the NBN now, are they? Yeah, yeah, they're connected to some form of it. I'm not going to mm. tell you exactly which one, but um, you know, and I actually noticed there were um in the AP Wirelands down in South Australia, they've just put a 4G tower in, and up mm-hmm. in Aracoons just recently had a 4G tower. So I think it's really exciting as we get. Yeah better wireless technology we're starting to really connect our com- our remote communities across australia to you know to australia and to the world as well so that oh, that's something that really excites me the wireless technology <laughs> so it's a past time of peter and i to give the nbn grief but uh, <laughs> yeah. they're actually not doing a uh, a good job in some places yeah, I can understand the logic of connecting regional Australia. So Especially the been schools. A way in the schools in particular. Yeah, like you can see the global village when you have like a super fast connection and then everything is at your fingertips. I think that's Yeah, and I think incredible. particularly when we want to be creative in how how our economies develop in these remote areas, you know. Without without connectivity, you can't connect into, mm. into these micro economies on the internet either, so... You sort of get limited to these traditional, you know, land management, mining, pastoral yeah, yeah. industries. But having that connection really opens up the opportunity to to develop private enterprise in these areas and, you know, bring other opportunities in. You, you spoke of infrastructure at those smaller towns, like 10,000 people is not a small town, but compared to, say, Sydney or Brisbane, it's tiny. But services are not just roads anymore and electricity lines it's it's the digital highway Peter. right mm. <laughs> so you get telemedicine of course you get yep. education you get commerce like uh, it's just night and day mm-hmm. what you can do with a good network oh absolutely so yeah i'm i'm waiting i'm waiting for the <laughs> one, day, one day <laughs> In your poor depressed town, bro. <laughs> yeah it's a, it's a bit of a worry when the the amount of money sort of pushing in the, the fibre, rolling the fibre out and then thinking how how quickly, you know, we're, we're progressing with the with 5G or next G mm-hmm. or, you know, the gigabit gigabit connections across Wi-Fi so, or wireless infrastructure. So that I think that's going to really be a game changer in these remote areas over the next 5, 10, 15 years. Yeah, so, ab- absolutely. So, Jesse, tell us what you're doing today. Like, where are you at today? And today I'm in my office uh, in Townsville, which is based at um, CSIRO's joint venture site with James Cook University. So we're called the Australian Tropical Sciences and Innovations Precinct, Mm -hmm. or ATSIP for short. Um, And I've just been doing a bit of work on the Inquiry for Indigenous Science Students Program, the program Mm -hmm. I work for under the Indigenous STEM Education Project. That's uh, managed by CSIRO and funded by BHP Billiton Foundation. Okay. So 
What is the inquiry? Like when we think about inquiry, we think of like an inquiry into the banks or... What's the question? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, basically what our program does is we develop uh, Indigenous-themed hands-on science investigations mm-hmm. that, um, that, student, that we then go and deliver professional development to teachers to be able to deliver these, um, connect these authentic... Uh, traditional knowledges to the current science curriculum through uh, grades five through to nine. So what, what's the output there? Like, is it a series of units of work or...? Yeah, so, it's, so what we've got is uh, currently we've got seven different inquiries that are about 10 hours teaching sequence. They're designed mm-hmm. to be nestled into current teaching units. So you, where you might uh, state some matter in year five, you might, you know, get the kids to melt some ice and or freeze something or you put the kettle on what we do is we've developed an inquiry called what's cooking and we look at how aboriginal people and torres strait Islander people all over australia have understood states of matter and changes of state through cooking methods so uh and wrapping and unwrapping food and different cooking uh methods so how do we connect that authentically in our science classroom so if i understand right you are using, I suppose, traditional ways of preparing food that kids in those communities are familiar with, and you are giving them a, a science spin. So let's let's have a look at what happens to food once you wrap it, I suppose, in a particular way, or boil it, or do something to it. Am I understanding this right? Yeah, yeah. So we, we work in um, metropolitan regional areas. So we've got about we've got over seventy five schools in the program at the moment. Um, it's not just for Indigenous students, it's for all students. So mm-hmm. that's uh, really important that um, for all Australians to learn about these long-held, um, sophisticated understandings of, of different concepts that we, we call science now. And, you know, these knowledges, knowledges and complex knowledges have been around in Australia for, for over 60,000 years. So, yeah, so bringing, bringing that into the classroom and allowing kids to... You know, it's all underpinned by good science inquiry pedagogy. Mm-hmm. So it's all about, you know, hands-on, uh, good teaching of the science inquiry skills and, you know, connecting it with a with an engaging hands-on activity. And how are you delivering this or, or how are you training the teachers in these units? Yeah, so we do, um, we've got a teacher professional development package and what we do is we come and along and we train the teachers up. We go through our inquiry processes. We do a bit of cultural considerations around things you need to be aware of when you're working in uh, the Indigenous education space. Um, We talk about other programs that the Indigenous STEM Education Project and CSIRO offer. Mm -hmm. Um, And then what we, we actually have a suite of resources that the teachers then can get their hands on. Um, but we also follow up with classroom support afterwards. So we so we try and normally train the term prior and then the following term when they're delivering, we actually go visit schools and do planning with the teachers or we, they might sometimes, um, new teachers in particular to the program, like to watch us as a team, how, how we deliver, how we would deliver the lesson. So we, get, we go in and we deliver lessons or we team teach with teachers. It's all really about what that individual teacher is going to find most useful for them to get to the place where they need to, where they can do this stuff independently. Awesome, awesome. So you, I've got some great words here, classroom support, Indigenous consideration and uh, team teaching. That's uh, not something that I... Team teaching, yeah. 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 No, that, that's really cool. So I'd like to, I guess, start with what, what are the Indigenous, in broad strokes, considerations that teachers should consider mm-hmm. before embarking on something like this? Yeah, it's interesting. We always try and sort of scan out into what we need to consider with these things. But what we talk about is uh, we actually ask people to scan back inwards to themselves and okay. just understand that how, um, you know, it's it's there's a whole lot of body of work and we what we do is, is just touching the tip of the surface, you know, mm-hmm. around um, cultural awareness and cultural proficiency training. But what we do is we just make sure that our our teachers are are aware of their perspectives and how their perceptions shape their classrooms and and that not all, we don't all have the same 
uh, we don't all view the world with the same lens. Yep. So there's a lot of diversity within classrooms and there's, you know, diversity is great for science because that diversity of thought is extremely important. So we sort of start around that and then we talk about, you know, viewing these knowledges through a strength-based lens and the complexity of working with... Um, Indigenous knowledges in in the classroom. So a lot of a lot of teachers are you know the Australian curriculum has has what's called a cross curriculum priority. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them's um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders histories and cultures, and um, with the content and well the subject area and with the general capabilities, it's sort of the three dimensional picture teachers are supposed to teach with. But you know if we start looking back on what have we learned historically about Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people at schools? There's not a whole lot usually. So, or you might you might have learned uh, stuff that's that's not that culturally appropriate either, mm -hmm. depending on how long ago you went to school. <laughs> so, what what tends yep. to happen is um, teachers don't feel they don't want to, you know, and that's not because they don't value the knowledge necessarily. It's because they don't want to. Um, they don't want to be rude. They don't want to do the wrong thing. They don't want to offend anyone. You know, they 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 don't feel that they have the the sort of availability of the knowledges to be to be able to teach it authentically. And you know, and that can sometimes be a real blocker. But that's also what we we're trying to do is go. Well, look, we've developed this culturally safe, appropriate ways to do this that you can start this journey because it's a it's a it's quite a big journey. If we don't talk about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in our schools, in our classrooms, we're gonna get to a group of, you know, we're gonna be in the same position we were we are now where a lot of people didn't learn about it. They don't feel that they know enough about it. Mm -hmm. Um so it's it's really important for all of our kids to, you know, in, in all subject areas to to learn about Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia. And I, I suppose what we do is we provide the safe space for our teachers to build their capacity to be able to do that authentically. I wonder if there is uh, like an Indigenous flavour, <laughs> and uh, I actually thought about this word, like flavour in the kind of science that features in your programs you, you spoke about food earlier mm -hmm. but you know in my mind this, um, in my mind when I hear like when I hear indigenous Aboriginal uh, Australian uh, obviously the bush comes to mind uh, Taka yep. <laughs> um, knowledge about survival like where to find water for example how to uh, different kinds of soil I suppose um, the land uh, the trees, the animals and all that, there's a lot of science in there. And I wonder if through Aboriginal, uh, uh, what's the right word here, uh, tradition, some of that knowledge has, be, has been passed on through generations up to today. And if that, let's call it today, in today's term, scientific knowledge uh, features in this program and then uh, you know, it becomes codified into training for teachers and then for students. Yeah, so look, um, it's not uh, anyone's job apart from the people who own the knowledge to teach their culture and their cultural knowledge. Mm. What we do is we look at open, non-secret, non-sacred practices that occurred across Australia and across the world. So every person in the world at some stage has cooked food throughout history, you know, had fire starting methods, had uh, ways of using resins as adhesives, you know. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we start off with that big broad sort of uh, technology or understanding and then we, we sort of then highlight the complexity that was evident throughout Australia mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, Australia is not a homogenous continent. The the landscapes are extremely different from different places, avail resource availability and whatnot. So we uh, highlight the, the complexity of these knowledges and how they are applied, but the program opens the opportunity for the schools and the community to engage and find out what, what, sort of what how, this practices, how these practices were applied locally um, and, and working in with the local community to, if the local community wishes to do so, to share those knowledges and to talk about that local history as well, which is really important because we, we, we fall into these container words of Aboriginal 
people in Torres Strait Islander people are indigenous, but um, you know, we're talking about over three hundred different language groups and different, you know, more more countries than what it, what's currently in Europe. Yes, you know, so and different languages and different um, cultures within a within a culture. So it, I think it's really important that when we do this stuff, we acknowledge the complexity and the, you know, the un, the really in-depth understanding of Aboriginal people. You know, we're talking about the longest existing continuous culture mm. on earth, it, surviving in one of the, and thriving in one of the harshest in, environments. And, you know, in the, in the Australian continent, there's a lot of unforgiving places that people have lived in for a very long time and live mm. quite successfully and comfortably. So you said that there's a lot of knowledge there, but a part of that knowledge, if I'm using the right term, is you use the word sacred. So I suppose it's something that the communities themselves, through the elders or other structures that have evolved over time, would be responsible for transmitting them to new generations. But you're focusing on the science as we understand it today. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That, that's right. We're a science program. Right. The um, and non non secret, non sacred. It's not our, <laughs> our place to be dealing with that. <laughs> but, and that, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, there's definitely lots of places across Australia that still have practice and hold on to these traditional knowledges and and pass them along through the you know through systems of learning that have been in place for thousands of years yeah. you know i read a, an interesting the education system as we currently know it's only been around for you know, maybe 200 years uh, industrial with this sort of revolution yeah the, yeah. yeah so you know when we <laughs> there's a good quote i saw something about that being the experiment, not home learning. We've been home yeah, learning for yeah. thousands of years or something. So, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is there something that we can learn from the oral nature of, uh, I, I guess, Aboriginal teaching? Home education. <laughs> yeah, I think. Um, look, and I think science inquiry itself lends it very is mix it, uh, is is quite neat to sort of traditional ways of learning and pedagogies. You know talking to each other, collaborating, hands-on, uh, gradual release of responsibility. Like, these are all things that are that are evident through lots of uh, traditional teaching practices across Australia, you know. So, I was going to say, can you tell us more about the gradual release of responsibility? I haven't heard of that one. Yeah, so you might need to come up to North Queensland. It's a, it has to relate around uh, explicit teaching, explicit instruction methods. But So it's about modelling, you know, modelling for the child and showing them how to do things and then you joint construct and then you scaffold and then you slowly remove those, those scaffolds and you get to an independent learner. Mm-hmm. So that's... You know, ideally, that's what we do with our kids all the time. We we sort of show them a, a good example, and we show them how what we want them to do to succeed. Or and then we sort of allow that joint construction and the, the teaching process around the skills. Um, and then and then we get to an independent learner. So one um, old follow up here was having a chat with me. And he was talking about how he learnt to cook uh, cup murrays, which are ground ovens that you steam with. They're very they're very popular in, across the sort of top end region. So basically, you get and obviously if you're cooking for a lot of people, they're they're perfect because you can dig your oven as big as you want. So you're not sort of stuck cooking you, in, you in, in the kitchen. So that's yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So we link we link cup Murray's and because it's steaming, you basically it's a big steam oven in the ground. So we link that into changes of states. Matter. He was telling me about how he learned to do it, and then he said the old people would sit him down when they were kids. And, you know, come here, sit down. We're doing cup Murray tomorrow. Watch the adults do it. You know, and then as the kids mm. got older, it'd be grab this, do this do these things and then before they know it them old people are sitting down while they're all actually doing the cup murray (laughs) over time you know but that's that gradual release of responsibility the transfer of knowledge the you know it's not just about digging a hole putting some a fire in it with some rocks you know you've got to choose the correct rock the correct type of rock um that you know that it's not going to explode it's going to hold the heat for the longest so what are you going to wrap your food in you know what food actually cooks well in a cup murray versus what cooks better on roasting on the coals so People didn't just accidentally stumble across this stuff. Some form forms of scientific inquiry have been going on in Australia for thousands and thousands of years because 
you know, it's evidenced through... Medicine, perhaps, as well. Oh, all sorts of stuff, yeah. like uh, the cycad nuts are highly toxic. Yeah. Um, carcinogen, they contain cycasin, but... Um, you know, Aboriginal people all over the top end, different groups across the top end, had a process to detoxify the the nuts and actually turn it into a food source. And it was so True. successful, they then controlled their ecosystem through fire, using fire to manage to get rid of other competing species and bring in bring in more cycad stands. So then you could have a harvest. And, and it was actually described by Banks on the um, Endeavour that... You know, they noticed that the the people up there in New Cooktown, they had um, piles of these nuts, and I'd imagine the Banks and Co were running out of food, so they went and grabbed these <laughs> cycad nuts and started eating them, and they all got quite sick. And, and I think Banks has written it down as you know, um, healthy fit of vomiting and purging, and then they <laughs> fed it to the they fed it to the pigs, and the pigs died. <laughs> uh, you know, so <laughs> they sort of go, oh, something's something's Good here, time. but the, the, the lens at the time they're not thinking. There's this really in depth process around yeah. detoxifying the. Um, taking the toxins out, getting rid of the toxins so you can turn it into a staple food source. That's a great way to describe the scientific process, isn't it? Like you bring an example from tradition, essentially, like that's been happening for tens of thousands of years. And uh, yeah, yeah. you can show how it helps in really, I suppose, life and death situations. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't know what you're doing, that's it. Yeah, but I think the, you know, all... You know, science and the Latin root of the name science is to know, mm. you know, sciencia. Or, I think it's really important too to understand that through this process, you know, we're talking about a process that takes four days, uh, the amount of trialling, testing, re-interrogating your data, you know, it would have moved from animal testing through to human test groups, mm. I'd imagine, at the time. But we all start with this fundamental need and it's to solve a problem or to find a solution yeah. to something you know so that's the that human element of of science problem solving uh, jesse i wanted to ask you about pathways so one of the things that are happening uh, as part of the uh, stem education project is the science pathways for indigenous communities could you tell us uh, about that yeah, so the Science Pathways for Indigenous Communities is a, a program that we run um, with a team in Western Australia and a team um, in Alice Springs, and they're doing some really cool two-way learning stuff uh, with communities in, in quite remote locations. I think they, the actual term for a lot of them would be remote, remote. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, um, heavy, you it? know... Uh, some places, a lot of places out there have satellite internet. Satellite. Yep. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure exactly what all the setups are. Some some might be better service than others, but I think the the um, really interesting thing is you don't necessarily need the internet. We don't need to jam kids into classrooms in these places. And the the science pathways teams are working with schools and community to do some really high level, authentic learning experiences out on country. So people who are still in these in these areas are very close to their culture and their connections to the land and their obligations with land management. And there's a you know there's whole fields of science that have to do with this in our Western systems that we sort of are structured in in Australia. So you don't necessarily need the kids to jump on YouTube to see something they can walk outside and actually experience it and and connect their but culture and connect the connect the science. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, it's, cool. it's you know we've we've got what we're, we're trying to. I think they're showing some really successful ways of not trying to retrofit a, a city style education in the bush. You know, it's let's it's a bush education. Let's uh, let's make sure we're doing this authentically and we're um, maintaining curriculum intent and focus, but we're doing it in a way that's engaging and culturally appropriate and. Yeah, so they do a lot of travel <laughs> and out into remote areas, but they've had some really uh, excellent stories and, and excellent impact in the in the schools and teachers and community members they're working with. So does the the pathway has a, a specific outcome since it is a STEM project, uh, perhaps to you know influence uh, children to gain STEM related skills, or perhaps someday move into 
a STEM as a career? Yeah, definitely. So our um, the overall program, the overall Indigenous STEM education project's goal is to get more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people into STEM related employment and STEM related tertiary studies, you know, so STEM's our sort of one of the fastest growing uh, industries in in Australia and our mm. sort of economy is shifting over to this STEM based economy and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across Australia haven't necessarily engaged with STEM at the, at the same rates that it has been for other um, groups in Australia. So if we've started seeing a shift to automation and a shift away from a labour intensive economy, where does this mean if we're excluding any kid really from a good mm. STEM education? These these skills are transferable, they're, um, they're stuff that we're going to need in the next, we, we need them now, but you're gonna, it's going to be even more need for them in the, in the future. So the program's been developed to um, try and cover you know, regional, remote, metropolitan. It goes from prep all the way to tertiary level and, and it's done through the six different elements in the pr program. So science pathways for Indigenous communities is our remote element. Inquiry for Indigenous science students that I work on is our, um, our metropolitan regional element for science, science curriculum. Prime Futures is a partnership with um, Queensland University of Technology and the Yumi Deadly Centre. So that's uh, working from foundation to year nine in the mathematics curriculum. Assets is a summer camp for high achieving year 10 students that offer 105 places across the uh, across three camps over the summer holidays. Mm -hmm. There's a uh, Bachelor of Science Extended, which is a, a partnership with the Batch, uh, University of Melbourne mm -hmm. um, and is a degree program that provides supported pathways to complete the um, Bachelor of Science at the University of Melbourne. Um, and then the Indigenous STEM Awards, which are a ways, an award process to recognise um, community members, STEM professionals, teachers, students who are, you know, having a red hot crack at, at uh, good STEM practices, good STEM education practices in, in, for Indigenous people. So, uh, Michael, I'm going to ask you to describe some of the winners. Yeah. What did they win? Some of the projects. What did they do? Well, they win. <laughs> I think um, the the STEM professionals win a bit of funding towards their programs. Um, so a couple of the students are actually over at the. Uh, this I might have to double. It's there in Pennsylvania at the moment at the Intel World Fair. Mm -hmm. oh, so so they're winning the with. Yeah, so the students are, are tied in with the BHP Billiton Awards, which are another CSIRO program. Mm -hmm. So they've gone over with a, there's been a delegation sent over there for the kids to see that, you know, that really big world scale of what's, you know, what's our future focus. I think some of the teachers win, win, win some money for their school yeah. uh, and obviously they all, you know, win the... The prestige, I guess, of yeah. of being an award recipient, but there's some pretty high flying um, people on the who've, who've do, who are doing some really great things. It was a really quite a competitive field this um, last year, but this year it's actually open to all Australia. So could you, um, could you tell us some of the things that uh, the winners did? Like was it projects as in like uh, robots, for example, that do crazy stuff? Or is it like um, you know, um, a curricular, perhaps if you're a teacher, you wrote a book or a textbook, or what, what do the winners do to win? Uh, so the STEM Professional Career Achievement Award went to Dr. Misty Jenkins, and um, she's um, working down in um, Victoria and has been pushing some really key stuff forward in, um, in cancer research. Yeah. So, you know, a really established STEM professional in the career um, who's doing some really uh, world-first stuff down oh. there as well, which is... So, so one of the things that we think it's important was to, um, you know, to make sure that our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids have, have science or STEM role models to look towards as well. Mm. Um, and, you know, this is because there's lots of... Um, 
Indigenous role models around Australia, but it, 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 part of it is to let's highlight some Indigenous STEM professionals. Uh, uh, just so, sorry to interrupt you. I'm just looking at the CSRO page on the award winners and finalists, yep. and I uh, just wanted to read out a couple of winners, like the one that she mentioned, Dr. Misty Jenkins. She's yep. also uh, awarded the 2016 award by Westpac, Australian Financial Review's Top 100 Women of Influence. So she's got that award. She's done uh, a lot of other amazing work here. Uh, she is a scientist. Uh, then we've got the STEM Professional Early Career Award winner, Dean Foley, for example, a Camilla Roy man. So he grew up in the Aboriginal community in Gunanda at New South Wales. He's involved with Coda Dojo, which a lot of mm -hmm. us know and admire as well. So that's awesome. And there's many others. So there's the Tertiary Undergraduate Student Award, Charlene Isaac from Western Australia, secondary winner, Kyla Patel. So it looks very impressive. And there's a lot of information here for anyone interested to see what these people do. Yeah, definitely, and it'll be um, it's probably that's probably the best place to go to. But it'll also give people a, an idea of what um, you know the hard work they're putting in when these awards mm. open again at, towards the end of the year to encourage people to apply and celebrate the the, the hard work that a lot of um, teachers, students, STEM professionals um, put into the you yeah. know into furthering themselves in the STEM fields. It is hard work. We'll have this information in our show notes for anyone interested. It's really worth having a, a browse there. Sounds good. Next question. Next question. We probably, oh, gee, look at the time. We probably should get round to our rapid uh, fire uh, questions unless you've I've got, got something. I've got like. one. Uh, okay. Just one, and then we'll go into rapid fire questions. Um, I know that one of the things that are happening as part of the, as far of, of the project, is the Bachelor's of Science degree offered by the University of Melbourne. It seems to me that it's specifically geared towards Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. And just wanted to ask you if that is true. And I wonder, why is there a need for such degree? Is there something different or a different spin, I suppose, in that degree compared to like mainstream Bachelor of Science degrees? Yeah, the Bachelor of Science extended... Uh is a, has been based, has been designed off, um, they were running a Bachelor of Arts extended that with a similar design. And, and it comes down to that, um, you know, in, it's not necessarily Indigenous enrolments in tertiary, it's Indigenous, com it's completions. So mm -hmm. how do, you know, uh, tertiary institutions are quite... Uh, you know, they're quite complex and confronting places for young students uh, when you come from a dominant culture, uh, let alone when you might be travelling away from home for the first time or you may be from from a small area. Um, so what the Bachelor of Science Extended does is it provides that pathway for the Indigenous students to embark on a career and build strong science success. They're doing some really good work down there with getting... Uh, the cohorts in and also having kids transition back out into just into the mainstream yeah. Bachelor of Science that the University of Melbourne offers. It's also supports with the residential program um, that allows students to engage with, with these university systems in a, in a culturally safe way. Oh, right. So um, so I think... Sorry, just so that if I understand right, the science, the, uh, the, the subjects that you have to undertake in order to graduate are, are similar to what you find in other science degrees, but it's a cultural aspect of the degree that makes it different. It's perhaps more culturally appropriate for a particular cohort. Yeah. I was going to ask, right? along the lines of that, yeah. how does it maintain retention or how does it increase retention versus a... Of uh, what is taught, you mean? Yeah, well, no, retention of uh, the students. Oh, no, the, the students are leaving. Yep. Yeah, I think, um, look, I, I don't work directly with the program and it's, it's part of the thing, uh, part of the bigger, bigger project umbrella, but um, I think retaining students in, in a tertiary sense is about making sure that they're comfortable, they're, they've got the skill set they need to be able to succeed in in tertiary. So often they can be, uh, you know, if we come into, it's about how do you 
connect these students up with the support services that are in place for mm. for that pastoral side of things, but also the academic support services um, into a system. You know, I know when I first started university, it was it was a big change from high school to university, and just the the scale of it and who do I talk to and sitting in a lecture with 300 students and, you know, like yeah. how do I, how do I, who do, how do I even ask a question, you know, is, um, and I'm coming from a, a background with, uh, an, you know, an educate with my mother who was a teacher at the time. So sometimes a lot of these kids might be the first uh, student in their, f- child and their family who are going on to higher education. So they don't have the, the sort of support or the, the home, they're completely trailblazing for their family. You're removing one more barrier, right? That psychological, very important barrier very often. Yeah, and I think you, you, it's, yeah, that's right. It's about how do we set, set our kids up for success and, you know, the, the stuff that's out there is uh, showing that through the offering these support, like these types of supports, you're going to get more kids finishing, mm. finishing STEM degrees. So, yeah. That's great. I, I get it. <laughs> um, we'll get into rapid fire questions in just one minute, but I've, I've got one last question in this segment. Uh, Australia being a place where a lot of people uh, come from many different places, a very diverse, perhaps the most diverse place on earth. And think about it with over the last uh, 60,000 years, and as you said, Australia being as complex as Europe, perhaps more complex than Europe, oh. the, the number of nations and languages spoken. And I was thinking, how can we take what you've learned, you know, yourself in your career, but also as part of the project, of the and project perhaps yeah. use it for the benefit of other communities as well? Yeah, I, th- I think it's about understanding that, um, you know, one of the big things we've learned in this project is that, um, you know, building Indigenous knowledges into the curriculum, it's all there. There, the, the opportunity to do it is there. It's about trying to find the, the right way to do it and yeah. doing it in, in a safe and appropriate way. Um, so I think what we've learned is we've learned that it's really important for schools to connect with community and community c- to connect with schools. Uh, so oh, yeah. And to be able to bring these evidence of knowledges and 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 make them real make the learning real for the students mm-hmm. but but also to know i think you know one of the one of the big things is that and they talk about this year's national reconciliation week mm-hmm. uh, uh in a couple of weeks and the theme is don't let history be a mystery you yes. know and and, it, and an aboriginal history across australia is probably is a mystery to a lot of um Very non-indigenous true. people yeah. and i think yeah. what we need to do is we need to really highlight and celebrate and expose aboriginal tosh on the knowledges and ways of doing and being and it's from a strength-based position because like you know particularly we're moving into sustainability we're talking about a lot of a lot of uh, we're moving out of our mining boom so we're shifting mm. to how, how do we rehabilitate these sites that have been mined? And, you know, and, and we're starting to look at how, how um, Aboriginal people managed Australia for thousands of years to, to try and return these sites back to a, um, a functioning ecosystem again. Mm. So Yeah, that was, that was awesome. Yeah, Marcus. So I think it's time for rapid-fire questions. Go for it. And uh, my really simple question to you is what resources do you think the government could provide that would provide you with the biggest uh, amount of change? Mm, it's super working. Give you the, yeah, the greatest amount of leverage in when it comes to teaching students. Oh, I think the it always comes down to the dollar sign, doesn't it? The, yeah. <laughs> with um, with with government funding, you know, we we expect teachers to to do things that are above and beyond what the government pays for, you know, we, we, we want a modern education with a with a funding model that's probably 30 years old or, or older, you know. Mm. So if we want our teachers to be able to, to do their best and do, which they're trying, we need to support them through more teachers, uh, less face-to-face time, more time to do these sorts of, um, you know, these good teaching practices that we all know are there, but we need our teachers have time to do it and, and that takes money so I think I think the government just needs to we just need 
we need to invest in education. Like it's just, if we're not investing as much as we can in education, we're shooting ourselves in the foot as a nation. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting, right? We're, no matter what you invest in education, you know that it's going to pay back. That's, and it that's is crazy an investment, thing. not an expense. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's an, exactly. It's an investment and uh, sometimes. Um, yeah. Here's more, one from me, Jesse. Uh, apart from your mother, who has been the most influential person in the way that you teach today? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna when I answered that, I was gonna go, oh, well, that's been mum. So, <laughs> but apart from mum, look, I think my um, I drag, grab a lot of energy from collaborating with people. So I'd say mm. they, there are just too many people to that who have influenced me as an educator. But I think um, you know, I I get influence a lot of people influence me daily and you know and i think that's that's where i get a lot of energy from working with other people absolutely mm. a lot of uh, our guests actually say the same thing that uh, i can't think of a single person like there's so many you can't single them out and I, that applies to me as well like if somebody asks me that question i don't know there's so many which is mm. great yeah yeah no it's, yeah it's a nice um you know, it's, it's it's it's. I think it's indicative of the industry we're in. Is that you know, it's through learning from with each other and from each other, we can really progress forward with stuff. We don't learn in isolation. We are the sum of no, all our no. experiences. Yeah. <laughs> so, mm. what what advice would you give educators who are teaching with the material that you're making? Um. <laughs> You, you know, embrace it and have have a go. When you've got something we've we've designed with the structures and support in place, I think it's really um, a good safe spot spot for teachers to really have a try and um, improve their practice into a space that we the, there isn't necessarily a lot of uh, resource support for. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, I'd probably say <laughs> ring, ring, ring your support person. Talk to people. You know, talk to each other. That's just. Um, but but yeah, don't um, don't. No, there's probably no don'ts. It's just yeah, <laughs> get in and <laughs> enjoy, yeah, enjoy it. And um, you know, I think you'll find that it's a it's a really great way for kids to um, experience Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledges in in science, which is. Um, the more diversity of thought we have in science, the better. And forget about holidays over the two months uh, <laughs> period, right? Yeah. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> I just have got uh, one last one. Algebra or geometry? <laughs> I really like algebra. <laughs> well, you're a natural person. Uh, I'd imagine mm. that you're a geometry person. Did you? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I think, um, I think, yeah, well, I remember talking about this question a while ago and I, I thought I did like geometry, but I think I like the fact that I can actually, um, algebra will eventually lead me to geometry anyway. So. Exactly. <laughs> you know, the reason I brought that up is I was reading with a new scientist that there's actually a lot of work being done in unifying these two fields of mathematics mm. into one, which is amazing when you come to think. They're, yeah. they're being separated. So uh, for so long, since inception, but there you go. Yeah, and I think that's a... That's a, some. So, Dr. Chris Matthews um, has done some. He's an Aboriginal man uh, who's um, got a PhD in mathematics, applied mathematics, and he's mm. doing some really interesting stuff into um, how looking how an Aboriginal person's or Aboriginal people's traditional world views and how that fits into the mathematics system because of viewing the world as a whole and, you know, maths is a way of describing our world, isn't it? Oh, so, that must be a very interesting read. Is mm, there a resource yeah. you can point us to? Uh, yeah, definitely. I'll you? find some um, stuff there, but if you just do a search of um, Dr. Chris Matthews, you'll find quite a body of work. Got it. Awesome. Well, anything else? No. Marcus? No. Well, it's Jesse, it was awesome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you have <laughs> yeah. any parting thoughts for our listeners? Any do's, don'ts, anything to look uh, out for? I, I, I would keep going, but we've got an appointment. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I don't think so. You know, everyone just enjoy what you're doing and yeah. everyone's, you know, we just, it's such an important job that is... Um, it takes an educator to, you know, a lot of our educators know straight away that how important education is, but it's, it'd be nice to start seeing that um, shift into general society about how much hard work our 
teachers across Australia put in and how much expertise they bring to the field and the challenges and complexities of, of the, you know, modern education. Just um, yeah. keep, keep, keep keeping on and find those support networks. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Before we let you go, we've got one more question. Yeah, what is it? Well, <laughs> yeah. where can I let's oh, get in touch with you? Are you? Are you a Twitter person or a Facebook person or an email person? Why are we categorizing people today? Is this silo day? I don't know what's going on. Yeah, it's, it's all that's a very binary question. I like to so, I, I like to go across multiple platforms yeah. depending on what my uh, what my need and feelings are. So um I find Twitter I don't I probably lurk a lot more on Twitter. I like Twitter for easy access to, to when information's getting released. So I find I follow a lot of government departments and corporations that are sort of pushing out these these bigger reports and stuff like that. So more so than following someone who's um, sharing their breakfast or, or whatnot. <laughs> but um, I think uh, Twitter Twitter's an important connector. I enjoy the um, connecting it to my to my interest, which is in education, mm -hmm. how, how professional. Can people, how can people get in touch with you if you'd like them to do so? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, not the uh, it's not the most modern way, but an email always works. works. <laughs> but, yes. um, yeah, look, I don't um, email. My information, I imagine, will be on here or LinkedIn. LinkedIn is good too. I'm mm -hmm. probably using that a lot more um, for for than I have been. So, yeah, LinkedIn or email, but I can, I think you guys are putting my details up. Yep. We'll that right? or, yeah. So they can... Yeah, and if, you, if you, people want to go onto the um, CSIRO website and look at the Indigenous STEM Education Program, there's um, contacts and stuff on there as well. That's great. Mm. Well, thank you very much, Jesse. Uh, wish yes, you a thank you. very awesome rest of the day and uh, good weekend. And... Uh, I hope to have you on again soon. Yeah, no, thanks very much. It's been been a, been a blast. That's great. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Cheers, bye. That's all for this episode. The notes for this episode that include links to many of the resources mentioned and information on how to get in touch with Jesse are available on our website, texplore.com forward slash p forward slash stemiverse. Each episode comes with its own page on the Tech Explorations website and a gold mine of information in the notes. This Stemvest podcast episode was produced by Tech Explorations. Do you have any questions or suggestions? Would you like to nominate a friend or colleague to be our guest? Please email us at pa at texplore.com. Subscribe to us on iTunes by searching for the name of our podcast, STEMiverse. That's S-T-E-M-I-V-E-R-S-E. -E -E. Thanks for listening and we'll see you again next time.